he took some of his prize money that he got for computation and used it to buy uh, experimental machinery, right? Uh, which I thought was really wasted. No, uh, <laughs> very smart on his part. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> he didn't buy a mid flux, right? Uh, so, uh, and I remember one of the projects he worked on was with uh, Wolfgang Baumeister, who at the time, they were both trying to study the synaptic junction. And, uh, and I think they had decided to build like a liposome or some type of micelle and put many of the proteins that help form the junction uh, on the surface and then try to then control more the interactions of them. And I noticed you had at least one paper associated with the synaptic junctions, but she also worked with people like uh, Benkovic, and I forgot who else was on the list. So she's had a lot of experience. She's uh, got her degree in chemistry. She's now at the University of Maryland in Baltimore uh, uh, County in the chemistry department. She has also a professor of analytical chemistry, I believe, as well as biochemistry. So uh, she's had a lot of experience and you're gonna hear today about uh, some of the spectroscopy that she did in order to identify these condensates. And as I said, it's yet another important condensate that we're going to see uh, in, in eukaryotic systems. So after this long introduction, and I apologize, uh, 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 that um, uh, please go ahead and start your, your seminar. Thank you, thank you so much for the invitation and then really nice uh, introduction. It is such an honor for me to be here. Uh, and I'm so glad I I got here. <laughs> so on the way here, I, I just want to say it. Uh, I just had to take two flights from Baltimore here, um, but my journey started from 3 p.m. yesterday, and then I got here by about 5 a.m. <laughs> two two times of the flight got uh, uh, the stopped in the like a St. Louis and then Oklahoma because of they had the engine heated heating problem. <laughs> and then so that, 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 yeah, it was it was a long journey, but I'm so glad I'm here because last time my first attempt flights that gave up on me, they canceled my flight. So this is my second attempt and this worked. So I'm so glad I'm here and then I can um, talk to you guys. Okay, so let's begin. My talk is about, uh, the fascinating the metabolism. Um, it is it is very uh, important uh, for the. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just click. I think. Um, okay, it, it is it is um, the important uh, because it is uh, linked with the uh, many chronic uh, the the. Uh, chronic and then uh, difficult to cure diseases such as obesity, cancer, diabetes, and um, and more, right? And then um, we are trying to um, understand how this metabolism is. Um, right. Yeah, I needed more uh, sleep, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, we are trying to understand how this metabolism is working in a little different angle, um, especially uh, by looking at the, the portion of the metabolic network. Okay. This is a 2D map of the metabolic network. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. There are more than 3,000 of enzymes are involved in this uh, network. And a series of the enzyme reaction forms the metabolic pathways. And then these metabolic pathways are connected to each other. Um, this, this is a, a phenomenal information. It's like many tens of the decades of uh, work has been accumulated to give us uh, important information and valuable insights. However, there are some important uh, aspects are missing, especially that what we are interested in. Those are, the, first of all, the nature is dynamic. Like 
why my first <laughs> attempt or the flying flight got canceled. Nature is dynamic, right? <laughs> the metabolic pathways were so dynamic. Um, they are not always active, uh, depending on the environmental cues and nutritional status, uh, cell, uh, the, the stress, uh, these metabolic network will change. Some um, network, some interconnection will be uh, strengthened, weakened, uh, reconnect, disconnect, and so on, right? Those kind of um, aspects we cannot see from this map. The second of all, some of the metabolic pathways are compartmentalized. For example, mitochondria synthesize ATP and fatty acid in a very small confined region. It has uh, all the necessary enzymes highly concentrated and then let them be very efficient to produce what they need to do. ER synthesizes steroid, phosphatase, um, paroxysm, uh, degrades of fatty acids, and so on. So then these pathways are compartmentalized. They are membrane enveloped. How these pathways interconnect with the other pathways, right? They are separated. The last question that I'm interested in is then what about the metabolic pathways outside of the organelles? They there are many more pathways in the cytoplasm, right? How these uh, open space, these enzymes, um, efficiently perform the disease of the reaction to produce their output, right? So those are the questions that I would like to address at least a portion today. Oh, and then especially if we think about uh, the how the cytoplasm is so packed Right, the or the enzymes in the outside of the organelles, it's gonna be very hard to find each other if they are just uh, uniformly distributed. So, oh, thank you. So we are focusing. Uh, we are starting from the the glucose metabolism shown in this red box. This red box. Let me see. <laughs> Okay, um, and then if we look at the glucose metabolism um, in more detail, it has two metabolic pathways, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis pathway. Glyc glucose degraded by 10 enzyme reaction and it produces pyruvate, and then this pyruvate uh, build the, the build from the pyruvate, uh, the uh, other way of the reaction gives the glucose as a final product. And then like many, many tens years ago, like a 70 years, about 70 years ago, this, these type of the question, like how these many enzymes in the cytoplasm perform the, the pathway, highly regulated pathway um, started. And then the idea was that these enzymes form a tight complex and then make a very narrow channel so that the enzyme to the other enzyme substrate can be transferred efficiently so that the product can be very efficiently made, right, produced. However, that idea was not completely confirmed because the, the papers were controversial to each other, uh, the enzyme interactions were not completely confirmed. That happened in the outside of the cell. The enzymes were purified and then they wanted to detect the enzyme-enzyme interaction and then um, rebuild the, whether they are forming the high complex or not. We took that idea, like they somehow they should work together in the cytoplasm, but maybe in cell, we, we will be able to see something different. And this is what we observed. Um, each row shows the same cell. So these three cells are the same cells. And then uh, in the center, the middle column shows the, the phosphoprotokinase, liver type phosphoprotokinase in the step three. Uh, they are labeled with um, OFP, orange fluorescent protein, and then transiently transfected in the breast cancer cell. It's a H, uh, 578HP. Yeah, it's a breast cancer cell. Okay, and then these um, these cells are showing this phosphoprotokinase liver type, um, and then they are not homogeneously distributed. 
they form little concha where the, these enzymes are highly concentrated. In the same cell, we uh, so we really transcribed it. Uh, in the same cell, this image shows the fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, which is the partner enzyme for this step three. So PFK is for the glycolysis direction, FBPase is for the gluconeogenesis. So, so Minji, yes. uh, many people are coming from bacteria and now you're showing a eukaryotic cell. Right. So what's the big blob in the middle? That oh, that's nothing? a very good question. So this whole thing is a one cell, and then this big blob is a nucleus, and then these outside of where the little puncta exists is the cytoplasm. So these, uh, as you can see, the the, the nucleus in the uh, this is a human cancer cell, and then the when we look at the FBPAs, they also not homogeneously distributed in the cytoplasm, instead they form the punta. When we overlay these two images, uh, this is the merged image, and then yellow spot indicating that these two types of the punctas are co-localized, mean, mean, meaning that uh, inside this spatially localized area, highly concentrated PFKL and FBPAs exist. And the same thing for um, the PKM2. PKM2 is in the step 10 to produce the pyruvate. Um, PKM2 and the PFKL are co-localized, uh, forming the in, uh, concentrated uh, assembly. And then here, it shows PFKL and then Pepsi K1. Uh, Pepsi K1 is in this step for the gluconeogenesis, and then they are co-localized. So that means, since all of them are co-localized PFKL, these enzymes are all co-localized. So we named them the glucosome. It's a co-localization of uh, enzymes in the glucose metabolism. And once we found that, we have tested uh, many ways, whether these glucosomes are authentic assembly or just uh, artifacts or some other personality found it, right? So uh, we tested many different things. In this page, I'm going to summarize uh, some tests and then later I'm going to show you more detailed uh, tests. So whether fluorescent tag, fluorescent protein, um, the facilitate the formation of the assembly or not uh, was a big question. So we tested many different fluorescent proteins uh, labeled in C terminal, T, uh, N terminal, and so on. All of them formed the cluster. And even we used the six amino acid epitope tag, which is called the tetracysteine tag. This one uh, can be very specifically labeled with the uh, organic molecule, organic dye, very small organic dye, just like a one nanometer size. Even when we use these uh, path, they form the PFKL assembly. I'm talking about PF PFKL assembly because PFKL is the marker for the glucosome. So yeah, formation of the PFKL assembly is independent of the choice of the fluorescent tag. And we want to see whether the, these assemblies are one of the stress granules or, or the aggressome, aggressome. So we visualized both of them together, TFKL with the stress granule, TFKL with the aggressome, and then they were spatially distinguishable. So TFKL assembly is not the stress granule or aggressome. We looked at the endogenous PFKL2 by labeling with the uh, site 3 staying the antibody. Um, so in, we did the immunocytochemistry. And then we observed the, the, the cluster of the PFKL. And then we made it sure that this endogenous PFKL is co-localized with our uh, expressed PFKL that we are using. So this one is showing um, as uh, site 3 stained endogenous PFKL and then uh, EGFP, monomer EGFP labeled PFKLs are co-localized. And then once we published this uh, paper, findings of the glucosome, like a couple of months later, two other groups reported that uh, they also uh, observed formation of the PFK, PFKL assemblies either endogenously and um, transfected from the uh, transfected one. 
Uh, those groups were one from UCSF and then one from Johns Hopkins. So we were very happy that not only we, we observed this, but also the in not only our hands, but other groups have observed it. So uh, yes, excuse me, but like with uh, the pyruvate, I maybe I'm, I'm mistaken, but I could swear that in the yeast, that last step is already inside of the uh, mitochondria. And it was sort of uh, difficult to tell from your co-localization of pictures that you first showed. Right. Uh, you know, that could be a little network surrounding the, the nucleus. So uh, is it in these cells, it is clearly... Uh, it's in the cytoplasm. It's in the cytoplasm? Yes. yes. And then when does it... But it also has to enter the, the mitochondria. That's right. That's right. The pyruvate enters the mitochondria uh, and then the, there is a PDK. The, there is another uh, mechanism to transfer the pyruvate uh, go to the craft cycle, and then so that that oh, okay. produces a So it's right. the the metabolites there, but the enzyme involved in the making of the pyruvate. Yeah, there's still the, in the cytoplasm. So pyru pyruvate is made by the enzyme in the cytoplasm. Okay. Somehow pyruvate needs to be transported to the mitochondria mm -hmm. and then being used there. So there should be somehow network each other, right? Okay. Yeah, okay. that's a very good good point. Yes. I like that. Okay. So, and then we we tested it further. Okay. So the glucosome um, is authentic, a new assembly in the cytoplasm. Then are they aggregates, right? There was also a very big concern. Maybe it's a aggregate, so that your enzymes are might not be moving around inside. So we did get this uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching uh, experiment. Basically, you photo bleach uh, a spot, especially the spot has to be the, in our case, it's the glucosome. We photo bleach the one glucosome. And then after the photo bleaching, what we measure the fluorescence intensity over the time. If the enzymes are um, actively exchanging the materials inside, in and out uh, from the surrounding, then uh, the fluorescence intensity will increase over the time. I don't know why this uh, increase over the time, right? And then um, that is what we have found. When we did uh, the PRAP experiment, uh, outside of the glucosome, PFKO uh, diffusion coefficient, we obtained as a 0.114 micrometer square per second. But inside the glucosome, it was like a seven times, about seven times the smaller diffusion coefficient we observed, but still they are on the way of uh, recovery. So this means that the enzymes inside the glucosome is not completely stuck. They are slow, but they are moving. So it's a mobile. And then that means this, that, that this is a way uh, to prove it's not an aggregate. And then we looked at Many, many cells. So the previously what we did is the HeLa cells and then the HH578 T cell, it's the breast cancer cell, um, see whether these cells are forming the glucosome. And then we um, were wondering, there's, there's different size of the glucosome exists, like a very, very small glucosome to very large. Uh, these, so the, we, we categorize them as a small glucosome. These are more of a point spread function size. Uh, these, are, these are larger than point spread function, but we only see these large, large glucosome from the cancer cells. So, um, by the way, these or the results has been confirmed with the uh, cervical breast, liver, and pancreatic cancer cells. But we wanted to see whether these are showing in the non-cancerous normal cell too, right? And then luckily, uh, the patient who donated this malignant breast cancer cell, the cell line, HS578T cell, that same patient donated non-cancerous normal cell. That's the HS578BS T cells. So we uh, we visualized the glucosome there, and then we see glucosome formation there. But interestingly, these large large glucosome uh, we cannot find from the non-cancerous normal cells. 
So there is a separate um, project going on to uh, find a small molecule as, to target these large glucogen presenting cancer cells. Okay, and then next the task that we did is uh, in 2010, there was a proteomic uh, studies going on and then found out that many metabolic uh, enzymes are acetylated. And then one of them was a PFK. So we were wondering whether these acetylation with post-translation or modification can affect formation of the glucagon. So this is a wild type PFKO that's labeled with the EGFT, monomer EGFT. And if we mutate this lysine 689 disease that this was reported to be acetylated uh, in the proteomic study, but we uh, mutated this lysine to either alanine or arginine, then formation of glucosome abolished. If we mutate lysine 689 to glutamine, which gives the, the mimic of the oh, mimic of the acetylated uh, residue for the lysine, uh, then it still forms the, the glucagon. So indicating that some signaling pathway is involved to regulate formation of the uh, glucagon. Okay, so we were very happy to find out the glucagon. They are uh, not the already found assembly. And then these are not the aggregates. Um, they are they are related to the signaling pathways and so on. It's very, very good. But then always new question comes up, right? The first one was then okay, they don't they don't associate with the membrane, right? They are not bound with the membrane. How these multiple enzymes can be combined in the small space and time in the cytoplasm. It's open space, right? The second question that we had, if I mean, how these spatially localized glucagons and mitochondria are going to communicate. And the biochemically, as Jen mentioned, pyruvate, which is the final product of the glycolysis, has to go to the mitochondria. They are bio bio chemical, biochemically connected. Then how these spatially localized glucagon and mitochondria are going to regulate the, those communications, right? in the living cells. So that was uh, what we were aiming to answer. And to do that, we uh, built lens light sheet microscope in my lab because, because we are interested in space and time for dimensional network between two metabolisms in the living cells. Uh, this was a, this was a, to me, it was the clear answer because it provides uh, very fast super dimensional uh, imaging data so that the, you can see, I mean, relatively fast. And also it provides not as good as mean flux, but it provides uh, sub diffraction limited res spatial resolution, at least in the optical axis, Z axis. XY spatial resolution is the same as conventional microscope, it's diffraction limited, but Z, uh, depending on what type of the SLM pattern, you can get very symmetrical X, Y, Z point spread function indicating, I mean, the providing us, allowing us to image very small feature without distorted shape. So that's very convenient for us. So we use the time resolution of light. Depending on the, actually the, how small you can go, um, and then also how bright your dye is. Um, but like, usually we go with a one minute um, for that area particularly we are interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are scanning the whole cell and then the, the signal is weak, then it can go like a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah. But we don't want to go too long because the glucosome are dynamic. Not only enzymes are moving in and out. I'm going to show you. Not only enzymes are moving in and out, glucosome itself is dynamic. So you don't want to stay too long, then the, your data is screwed, right? So this is a cross image of the uh, cell showing uh, 
the front view and an angled view obtained from the LLSN. Um, the greens are the glucagon, obviously. The arrow shows that when these, and then this is a small glucagon, the bar uh, shows 500 nanometer. When these glucosomes are colliding each other, they merge, they undergo fusion. Um, and this is actually fast forward movie. It's about like a eight minutes total. Uh, so it's not this fast, okay? But they're, they are quite dynamic. Uh, and this is for the large glucosome. Again, like there is always concern the aggregates instead of a uh, uh, floppy assembly. So the large glucose, so the, there is a comment that uh, maybe the large glucosomes maybe that aggregates. And then we observe these large glucosome also undergoes fusion and fission process. You can see these two get fused and then small portions pinched off fission, and then even later, this one gets fused again. So large glucosome is not aggregate. They are also um, showing the hallmark property of the, the droplet, the, the condensates, biomolecular condensates. Okay, so they look like a condensate, and then a we, we dissected their properties a little more in terms of the how the enzymes inside the glucagon like are packed. <laughs> in other words, what is the concentration of the enzyme inside the glucagon? Whether are they okay, this is not the aggregate, this large glucagon are not the aggregates, but then are they having higher concentrated enzymes inside versus the other small size of the enzyme? So because we can get the, the volume and then integrated fluorescence intensity, we can get a pseudo concentration. Like, so what we did, it's not the, the concentration that we usually know, but what we did is we measure many, many glucosomes at different volume and uh, at, from the many cells. And then this graph shows the x-axis was the number of a box cell that filling the glucosome inside. The box cell is the two-dimensional, uh, uh, three-dimensional pixel. Um, and then this is that normal, normalized relative concentration of a PFPL. So since we are using the fluorescence intensity to get the concentration information, it's not an absolute concentration, but when we are comparing glucosome to glucosome, that's a fair, right? Because it's the same, same uh, fluorescence, same setup of the uh, experiment, same from the individual cells, right? And then if we look at the size of the glucosome from little over size of the 200 to like a 1000 voxel, then their concentrations are identical, statistically the same. Very interesting, right? I was impressed. I was uh, expected this one might be higher in uh, concentration, but it was not. They were they were quite similar. They have the same concentration, which indicating that these glucosomes are in the same tie line of the phase diagram. I'm gonna get to there a uh, couple of uh, slides later. Okay, and then we also tested uh, whether glucosomes response to the hyperosmotic pressure. It's a favorite, um, favorite experiment for the biocondensing people. Uh, and then, yes, they uh, promote the glucosome formation and then more glucosomes are, uh, the lar larger glucosomes and then uh, many, the diffusive uh, enzymes outside of the glucosome uh, involves, I mean, they're participating to the, the condensates. We looked at the many, many cells for that phenomenon. And then how many cells, how much, how, uh, how much percent of the cells are showing these dynamics uh, upon the concentration of uh, the salt in ACL increase and decrease, the glucogen formation has increased and decreased. Um, these type of the trend, uh, how much, per, how many percent of the cells are showing? It was about like a, about 80% cell shows this, um, the, the phenomenon indicating that, yeah, glucosome is formed by liquidy liquid phase separation. Then, then using those data, um, 
Oh, and then what, 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 yeah. So amount of the glucagon is definitely increased with um, high salt concentration. Um, so we measured what is the, how much they increase with the uh, LLSM data. So this, this data shows the cumulative volume of the glucagon in the individual cells. When salt was in a, a physiological concentration, 135 millimolar, uh, we uh, normalized uh, with that to this when we apply the high salt uh, media. Um, and then normal is 100%, and then with the high salt media, it was more than twice the amount of the glucosome was increased. So it's a volume, total volume of the glucosome, how much it's increased. Then we looked at the PFKL concentration <laughs> in the glucosome again, in the same way as I showed you before. This is that green shows the normal condition, and then red shows with a high salt condition when the osmotic pressure levels are five. Statistically, they didn't increase much, even with the high salt concentration. So that means, this is just a cartoonish diagram that I draw. The, this axis, this shows the concentration of the uh, PFKL in the cell. And then the y-axis shows the, the pressure. As pressure increases, tie line gets elongated, more phase separation can happen. But as you can see, this, uh, and then the, uh, yeah. And then this gray line is the, um, the phase boundary. Inside yellow is showing where the, the glucagon formation uh, condition and then outside is uh, just a mixing region, the no formation of the glucagon. And this green line indicating the, the 135 nanometer salt media. From, from here to here, the red line indicates the, the high salt concentration the media, right? And when these high line meets the phase boundary, especially when it meets the, the lower concentration region, that concentration indicates the outside of the glucagon, uh, the PFKL's concentration. And then when these uh, high line meets the high concentration region, that concentration is the PFKL inside the glucagon, okay? But when we increase the pressure, Inside the glucagon, the PFK concentration barely increased. That means this phase boundary is very steep. But instead, outside has to be very slow, slow steep, uh, the low stiffness because the inside itself, the PFK is a limited amount. If you make a more, if you are um, having uh, the more glucagon, even though they have a same concentration uh, inside uh, the glucagon, the more, more glucagon than outside glucagon, the concentration of the enzyme should be getting lower. <laughs> Am I, I feel like I mumbled a lot, <laughs> but yeah, does, does, does it make sense? Any, any question for this? Well, I guess, you know, the, the main pathway, particularly when you're looking at the PFK, Yes, it'd be nice if you could also uh, look at some of the other That's concentrations. Right. Yes. But what's important is these bacteria, mm -hmm. and I see eukaryotic cells from the lens of a, a bacteria, uh, you have a, a, a shunt off to help make lipids and another one to off make nucleotides. That's right. That's you know, right. Uh, is there any way to, what you're really trying to get at is the concentration of these various Enzy uh, glycolytic enzymes mm -hmm. uh, within and outside right. of the glucosome. Right. Could you perhaps try to correlate that with any variation in, I don't know, a lipid production uh, or so or nucleoside production? Yeah. So I, I mean, you are always ahead of my slides. I'm gonna talk about that. That's, I mean, that's, this is a great. That means that you truly understand, and then like you have a very very. Good questions. I, I really like that. Okay, I will get to there. 
Uh, not necessarily with that. I mean, yeah, probably in, and even with the concentrated group. But I will show you how the four dimensional network is related to that other pathway interconnections. Okay, I will at least say a little bit. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, so that, I think this is a fascinating because, okay, 200 millimolar salt uh, is also in the physiological range. Like uh, if you are eating very salty food, then your your salt your blood salt concentration is about to get to there, right? So cells are daily daily basis. Your you cell get the um, the stress, this hyperosmotic stress, and then release from there. But what does the uh, what does the cell does is that these glucosomes internal molecular characteristic is not changing. Just by increasing the amount of glucagon, they uh, adapt the, they try to respond to the stress. And then when the salt is gone, I mean, go, go, go down to the normal, uh, they just uh, reduce the amount of the glucagon. So it's not a very, yes. Can you see that kind of change in size? Yes, that, yeah, yeah. And then also it actually, the, that happens re really quickly. Like a with uh, like a, you can see the promoted uh, glucagon formation getting larger and then even uh, non from uh, created new new one. Uh, it's like a couple of minutes and then like a, in fifteen minutes it's like a, almost a max, <laughs> right? And then once you decrease uh, salt concentration back down to the one thirty five, then they go down really quickly too. So the cells are really, um, the, by having this glucogen condensates, it's very readily respond to the environmental uh, the stress, right? So that's, that's a really good uh, way to adapt the situation for the cell, right? Okay, so then, yeah, the glucogen is formed by phase separation. Then are they really pathway specific? Are they only having the glucose related enzyme or many other pathways, enzymes are just randomly come in, right? So we wanted to find out um, that. So what we did is, again, glucose metabolism is here, and here, there's a glucosome, and there's another metabolic multi enzyme, uh, con uh, the, right, the assembly, uh, so-called the purinosome, the bank of its work. Mm -hmm. um, and then the do novo that is related to the do novo purine biosynthesis pathway. If there is a six enzyme involved, and then the pathway is up, up here. So we visualize these together in the cell, and then the glucosome and pyridogens are independent of each other. And this is what we observe. Yes, they are just randomly distributed. Some some kind some cases they kind of very close, and then looking like a bound, but. Remember the glucosome when they are colliding each other, they merge. They do not undergo merge. That means the glucosome specifically parted the grafts the enzyme related to glycolysis, not the purine biosynthesis pathway. So it looks like a glucosome glucosome is pathway specific, right? And then so then why how how they become pathway specific? So we hypothesize that maybe there's a selective enzyme-enzyme interactions going on inside these condensates, right? So we use exceptional photobleaching method. This is a very similar to the FRAP, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching method. Uh, but basically, uh, if these two enzymes are interacting, then once you photobleach the acceptor, your donor's fluorescence intensity will jump. Right, because there is a no more energy transfer from donor to acceptor. So this is uh, how uh, you expect to see fluorescence intensity of the donor will be jump when you uh, photobleach the acceptor, and then that how much increase can be transferred to threat efficiency. So what we did is we uh, so this is an in cell threat uh, experiment. Uh, PFKL is labeled with M cherry. And then PKM2 is labeled with the monomer EGFP. And then we did the uh, acceptable uh, protein experiment. Inside the glucagon shows in the green, outside of the glucagon shows in the red. As you can see, outside the interaction is 
uh, in the noise level. And then inside, they have significant threat efficiency, indicating that they are interacting, and especially these interaction is promoted inside the glucosomes. And then we looked at whether these interaction is a very stable interaction or transient interaction. So to address that question, we looked at that diffusion coefficient for both enzymes when they are simultaneously uh, transfected. If they are stably uh, trans uh, the interacting, these diffusion coefficient of both enzymes should match each other inside of glucosum, but they were very different. In fact, it's like a 2.5 times larger diffusion coefficient that we observed from the PKM2. And the PFKO is much, much slower. So that means there is a selective and transient enzyme-enzyme interactions going on, and that facilitates the pathway-specific phase separation of the glucosome. Okay. Um, and then in the biomolecular condensates field, there is a, when they form the condensates, there are two kinds of a constituents. One is the scaffold, the other one is the, the clients. Scaffold molecule is the one forms the condensates, and then clients are the recruited by scaffold protein to interact inside the condensates. And then when that happens, what, what you usually observe, one, the scaffold uh, constituent are usually very well concentrated inside the condensates. But client is participation participation coefficient is much smaller. This is what we always observe that like PMKL has very well distinct condensates uh, in the formation, but PKM2, FVPAs, uh, or those enzymes, when we visualize together, you can see the background signal. That means not highly participating to the glucosome. So we looked at the partition coefficient. And then PFKL to PKM2 is like almost 10 times different mm -hmm. uh, partition coefficient we observe. And because we had this, it's the same data I showed you in the paper, division coefficient uh, decrease in a different order. We used Einstein's box equation to calculate what is the, what is the molecular weight, I mean, so before we go, um, use the Einstein stuff equation. There is a three assumption. One, both the enzymes are spherical, right? Mm -hmm. And then two, um, oh, the the because this uh, the amino acids polymerized amino acids tangled on, so the density of the protein is identical. That's the second assumption. Third, um, PFKL is inter the, their interaction is similar. Interaction, uh, quant interaction amount is similar so that each enzyme experience the same viscosity. Because with these three assumptions, when we compare uh, these two enzymes inside the glucosome, PFKL is 14, about five, 15 times bigger than PKM2. But sequence based molecular weight is just 1.3 larger PFKL than PKM2, meaning that PFKL is maybe it's not alone. I mean, uh, maybe they form the oligomer. Like here, the PFKL already having a high partition coefficient. Maybe it's alluding to us that it's the scaffold. And then scaffold are uh, how they the the property of the scaffold is usually they have a multivalence. And multivalence means that uh, it has a multiple interaction points. And this diffusion coefficient uh, experiment tells us that this large PFKO, maybe this PFKO forms the oligomer having a multiple interaction points, so that it may it it, so it acts as a uh, scaffold protein, right? So we tested that by doing this um, 
another acceptable probability method. This time, if they are forming a ligomer inside the glucagon, we should be able to see the PFKL PFKL interaction, right? So what we did is we uh, transfected the cell with uh, PFKL green, PFKL red, and then yeah, they are co-localized. And what we observed is this: the red shows the outside of glucagon. Green shows the inside of glucagon. In the red, there is a some red efficiency going on. And actually, the PFKL exists as a dimer. And then if, if dimer, and then when they are active, they form tetramer. And this is a PFKP crystal structure. We don't have a PFKL's crystal structure yet. PFP's crystal structure, if you look at the dimers, C terminal to C terminal distance, this, this upper part is the one dimer. This is another dimer. Now they are interacting forms of um, tetramer. And then this distance is about 75 angstrom, um, 74.7 74 angstrom. So these spread efficiency is kind of matching with the dimer uh, C to C um, uh, distance. And then, so the probably this tells us that the PFKL exists as a dimer outside of glucagon, but inside of glucagon, it shows much higher fret efficiency. And then if we calculate the, the distance, average distance between PFKL and PFKL is about 5.5 nanometer. But even though when they form the tetramer, this is not possible because or other distance between uh, with other C terminals is over 100 angstrom. So they cannot um, contribute to the press signal. That means these PFKL interact with other PFKL forms the, uh, the, so that the, you, uh, we can observe, uh, we obtain this high press signal. So PFKL, PFKL are interacting inside the glucagon, especially the tetramer one, and our Hypothesis also is supported by other groups paper. Um, crystal structure is not there, but there is a trioium structure. And this group found out that in vitro, when um, PFKL tetramers uh, were, were supplied with uh, enough metabolites, then they form this filament structure. Then these PFKL, PFKL interaction is happening, right? So probably what, what uh, with, the, with the, all these data and then from outside uh, other groups paper, what we believe is that uh, PFKLs form the filaments, they start to condensate and then they recruit other enzymes and then having uh, these uh, enzyme enzyme specific interactions uh, going on. So this multivalent transient interaction between PFKL and other enzymes, um, actually facilitate on the, this pathway-specific glucagon. Okay, so now the first question is done. Now we are moving on to the second question. Okay, so then we're running a little late. Uh, oh, what, how much time do we have? We started late. Though. We started late, I think another five minutes. Five minutes, okay, I will go fast. Okay, so now the glucagon is formed, but they should be, Functional, right? That's what we wanted to see. So what we did is, and then if it's a functional, they should be some kind of uh, having a relationship with the mitochondria because like glucose metabolism is here, mitochondria ATP synthesis here, the pyruvate should somehow go into the mitochondria. So we visualize these two at the same time. And this is what we observe. The red shows the mitochondria, green shows the glucagon. If we even eyeballing, you can see some many glucagons are attracted to the mitochondria. And yeah, they, in, within our spatial resolution, uh, they look like a bound, right? They are very in a close proximity. We can measure 3D distance between these two quantities. And in what we over 2000 uh, times of the measurement, we found out that like 37% 37, uh, 37 of the glucagons are very close proximity uh, with the mitochondria. There are other glucagons that are away from the mitochondria in that we believe those are related to more biosynthesis pathway. Mm -hmm. So I will get to there a little more uh, detail. And again, they are dynamic, but the association of the glucagon with the mitochondria uh, is not disrupted, even though when they are moving along. As you can see, 
Um, mitochondria is moving a lot, the glucosome is moving a lot, still their uh, association is intact. To find out the so especially they are associated, that's great, that makes sense because pyruvate should somehow go to the mitochondria, but if they are all part, pyruvate have, has to diffuse, found the mitochondria somehow to, uh, to get in there. So what we did, uh, we, we uh, no, to, that then now to find the functional link, what we did, it, we interrupted the mitochondria function first, and then interrupted glycolysis, and then see how their uh, connection changes. First, we interrupted ATP synthase, and then PDH complex, and then we downregulated the glycolysis. When we impaired mitochondria function using either oligomycin or PDC inhibitor, what we observed is that glucose amount is decreased. This is the cell population showing decreased glucose amount. Uh, so for the oligomycin case, it's about like a 56, and then this one is a little over 80%. If we downregulate the glycolysis, we observe the complete different phenotype. This is the untreated cell. This is a shRNA targeted um, this hexokinase 2, that's the first enzyme of the glycolysis. It is downregulated and not completely knocked out. It's a knockdown. Then small glucosomes abolishes and then they form the large glucosome. And then you can see that naturally the contact between glucosome and mitochondria is greatly decreased, right? So since the small glucosomes are gone, we looked at the small glucosomes more. And then what we found is that untreated cell when we only look at the small glucosome, more than 66% of the glucosomes are very close proximity with the mitochondria, not like a 30 something percent. So small glucosome, mostly they are bound to the mitochondria, if I can say. If we apply the oligomycin, one third of them decreases, but this, the oligomycin led reduction of the glucosome is gets weakened and weakened as the glucosome distance is far away from the mitochondria. So spatial relationship is linked with the functional relationship. And then if we look at the large glucosome, larger than 90 voxels, first of all, they are less associated with the mitochondria. And then they are not much changing with the oligomycin application. So the colossal the glucosomes are to the mitochondria, strong, stronger functional link between them. And since the small glucosome is particularly interesting for, for the uh, interaction with the mitochondria, we thought small glucosome may have a different molecular characteristics. So we look at the enzyme compositional ratio. So PFKL is at the step three, PKM is M is at the step 10. If PFKL activity is relatively high than PKM2, then uh, what happens is that the metabolites, intermediate metabolites accumulate, and then it has to be shown to the other biosynthesis pathway, like a PPP pathway or um, these serin biosynthesis pathways and so on for the, for the eukaryotic cells. And then uh, if the PKM2 is more active than the poor glycol complete glycolysis is going to happen so that the pyruvate production is more happening. If, since, again, this is a fluorescence-based measurement, so we cannot get the absolute concentration, but we can have a relative, the ratio. So we looked at the, the glucosomes, small glucosome versus non-small glucosome, and then PFKL, Small glucosome, uh, it has a much less compared to the larger one. And then PKM2 were not uh, changing depending on the, the uh, concentration of PK, PFKM were identical for or size distribution, indicating that in the small glucosome, PKM2 is relatively more than the other side of the glucosome. So they are, they are preferred to undergo complete glycolysis then the rest of them are more biosynthesis pathway. Okay, so that is that is all. Uh, the, the, so that the glucosomes are functionally coupled with the mitochondria in advanced stoichiometry dependent manners. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Oh, 
and then if you if I have a one more second, um, the these are the, the acknowledgement uh, page. Uh, my group, um, the Aaron Kennedy did a lot of uh, the LLSM data acquisition, uh, and then Dr. Someone on my lifetime collaborator, um, who found uh, glucagon with me, and then Alicia uh, is the she's the artist for our work um, for the this paper, and then recently we got uh, the cover page, and this is drawn by Alicia, so it's. It's a artistic, uh, artistic understanding of the glucagon. <laughs> There's a larger one, smaller ones they are using. Okay, thank you for your attention and the great. Thank you. Thank you. So this was really beautiful work. Thanks for coming to Thank you. Um, so my question, I was really interested when you were talking about the concentrations yes. of the enzymes in the glucose. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I'm curious about, do you have any idea of what the concentrations are in those glucosomes relative to bacteria, for example, which are much more confined environments? Right. Because I was just wondering in the back of my head, is it trying to create these more confined spaces and other life that is much smaller already has these confined spaces, so it doesn't have to make them. Right, that's a really great question. Um, so actually, this kind of uh, inhomogeneous distribution of the proteins has been found from the bacteria first, uh, and then it evolved to the uh, the eukaryotic cells. So there are some some proteins, not necessarily enzymes, but some proteins showing like a one and one uh, core of the bacteria more highly concentrated than the other pole of the the other end of the bacteria and so on. So I I didn't particularly look for the enzymes case, but probably they are. Yeah. Okay. The yeah, I think. Or do you have some more of that question? Yeah. Very nice job. Um, I was wondering, like, what do you think about like how other like like the enzymes that you didn't mention? How do you right? I didn't show you the other um enzymes case because uh, the, but we did test it and then yeah they are colonizing. Um, the the reason that I showed you when you focused on the spore enzymes is because those spore enzymes are in the ray limiting step. It's a bottleneck. And then because these enzymes are irreversible, the other enzymes are usually bidirectional. It's used for the glycolysis and the gluconeogenesis both. But these enzymes are uh, only for the either glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. So Initially, we targeted them because they have to interact, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> to to determine where the uh, the metabolites should go, right. So that was our original idea, and then yeah, but we we do observe the other uh, enzymes are you know, colocalized together. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm curious, like, uh, have we been able to like uh, then white out the different enzymes? So you can't say it right now if you don't feel comfortable with that. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, what other enzymes did you see? Oh, okay. it's okay. beside the glycolysis. So yes, um, but Jane actually asked me like uh, how the these glycolysis pathways are gonna be, you know, with other pathways, right? Uh, so yes, we actually are expanding. Uh, we are looking into the serine biosynthesis pathways enzyme and then the PPC pathways enzyme. So whether they have any uh, interconnection with the glucosomes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are, but this is too too preliminary. So I would like to maybe next time. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Great talk, by the way. Um, Thank you. I was wondering if it's, you tested anything about the surface tension, especially since you were looking at um, the droplets and their interaction with mitochondria and other such droplets. I'm assuming a lot of these substrates have to go back and forth. Yes. And maybe have you, is there, have you tested anything dynamics to figure out the surface tension if that changes for substrates that enter in and out of those droplets? That's a great question. Yes. So in many droplet, um, in some droplet, um, the, the paper talking about the surface tension, but usually they are from the purified proteins. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh in our case it's or in living cells. Yeah. And then but we we are kind of um, I mean, I'm kind of imagining small glucosome 
bound to the mitochondria, they would be um, like a, their surface tension is much more uh, eased by binding mitochondria. Yeah, so that is that is only I, I thought about it, but we didn't have a really um, hmm, experimentally prove how much a surface tension is there and there. Yeah, yeah, but the, if we can, so these enzymes are actually really difficult to purify, especially yeah. the PFK. PFKL has like a 27 amino acid that can be post-translationally modified. So that's why there is a no crystal structure. Okay. The people don't want to even touch it. <laughs> so the, the EM data was uh, fascinating because we were desperate to see how the 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 their structure is looking like, but at least we have a cryo EM data. Have you considered using like image correlation or something to look at the edge dynamics? Image correlation for for the droplets to look at edge dynamics and surface tension. I think there was a paper published back in like twenty nineteen that okay. studied something not in glucosomes but in yeah. some droplets in the cell. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. Okay. Why should again? Yeah, but, uh, there is one thing some some of the diffusion coefficients that right. you brought up. That's right. They would make close to being good candidates for the min flux mm -hmm. because one of the things that we noticed is you don't want to label something that moves, it has to move less than one squared micron per second to be able to be able to do the tracking. Right, right. Localization is one thing. Of course, it'll depend on how many you have. Mm -hmm. Right. But um it for tracking, um yeah, it has to be. And so you had a few things that we I have a lot of idea. Yeah. Apply the mean flux. So it's oh, yeah. really great to discuss yeah. about that. Now yeah. I'm just more sensitive to it because that was the learning phase of yeah. many people at the beginning, like, oh, no, moves too fast. Yeah. <laughs> you can't follow it with the stone that shape, yeah. right? Yeah. So and then from the uh acceptor photo brushing data, actually that data shows there is um multiple things going on. Mm -hmm. And then the mean flux will be able to dissect those multiple things. So I'm I'm very interested in yes. Okay. So uh, any further questions? Then I think we'll thank you one more time. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you.